All right, let's turn our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read a few verses there and then one verse over in the book of Galatians just to get us started today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice beginning in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Over in Galatians chapter 2, if you'll notice verse 21, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If I was the title of the message this morning, it would be empty, worthless, which, by the way, is part of the definition of that word vain. I want you to notice from, uh, from the passages today that we've looked at, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he lets us know that a number of things are vain. They're empty. They're worthless. As a matter of fact, I, some of you may remember the story back in 1986. Now, I know, especially if you're a little older, you know the name of Geraldo Rivera. Geraldo Rivera was one of those, I, I hate to call him a newsman because he was more of a sensationalist news person. They found out that Al Capone had a, a, a time capsule of some sort in a hotel in Chicago. And so he convinced the TV networks to bring their TV camera, and they were going to open up that, uh, that safe or vault, whatever it was that, he, that Capone had, and they were going to open it up for the whole world to see after all the many years that that thing had been shut up. So the cameras were there. They made a big deal out of all of it. And when they opened it up, it revealed nothing but dirt. That was it. Millions of viewers for dirt. Just this last year, 2023, in August, a nearly 200-year-old West Point time capsule was opened up live on Internet live streaming. And, of course, there were a number of people who were set about to watch it, people especially interested in the history of West Point. The lead box, believed to have been placed by cadets at the base of a monument there at West Point. One of those cadets, by the way, was Robert E. Lee. But when it was opened, and uh, by the way, they had the cameras there for all of that. Uh, when it was opened, it appeared to contain little more than dust. You say, what on earth was the point? Well, evidently, it had had more in it than just dust, and it had a number of papers, and one of the seams evidently had leaked over those 200 years, and it had rotted away all the papers and stuff. There was some sediment at the bottom of the thing, and that was it. So there was a man by the name of Paul Hudson, an archaeologist. He took it, he took it to uh, his room to kind of just go through the dirt and the dust that was in there, and he had a brush, he had a little pick that he used to fool around with the bottom of the thing. And he found, after brushing away some of the sediment, there was the edge of a coin. Now, they had thought that that box had become worthless over the years. But they found five coins after he worked his way down into that thing, five coins and a medal. Now, they determined that the worth of those five coins and that metal that was in there was probably about $1,000. So it wasn't totally 
worthless, but it wasn't anything like what they thought they were going to find in there. This last week, I was reading in my daily devotions in the book of Galatians. When you read the book of Galatians, you find that word vain used several times in the book of Galatians. It's talking about things that are empty, things that are worthless. As a matter of fact, Jesus used the word vain several times. At one particular point, you remember, he said of the Jews, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And I got to thinking about that term, vain, and what it means, empty and worthless. And I thought, well, let me just take a look at some of the different things that the Scripture in the New Testament calls empty or worthless, calls vain. Uh, some of you have seen the road show where people bring in some family heirlooms or things that the family have had for a long time. And they go to look at it, they don't think it's worth much, only to find out they've got something worth a couple hundred thousand dollars. Things like that happen from time to time. Of course, disappoint are some people who think they've got something that's worth a lot and find out it's not really worth anything but to the family, and that's it. But I want to show you some things that God calls vain, calls empty, calls worthless in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, if you're still over there at the book of Galatians chapter 2, I want you to notice verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now that's a follow-up to what he says back in verse 16, when he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The reality of the worth of Jesus' death is linked to what it takes to get saved. If you can get saved by keeping the law of God, then Jesus Christ's death means absolutely nothing. If anybody, we got over, all, well, they're telling us we've got 8 billion people on the planet right now. Out of those 8 billion people, if one person could get to heaven by keeping the law, then Christ wasted his time on the cross. As a matter of fact, those who trusted his death, his burial and resurrection, you're still lost. If one person could get to heaven being as good as they can be, and fulfilling the law. Now, we know the scripture says that it, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. He says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And since we know that the wages of sin is death, we have all learned exactly the same thing from God. We have earned death, and our good works or keeping the law can never be good enough to get to heaven. Why? You're already a sinner. You're already lost. You already deserve death. The wages of sin is death. Well, I, I just want to get what I deserve. Well, then you're going to die and go to hell because that's what every one of us deserve. That's what I deserve. That's what the best person in this congregation deserves. As a matter of fact, that's what the best person in this country deserves. He deserves death because we've all sinned. And we are so serious of sinner that we have all broken the greatest commandment that God has. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 and 38, a lawyer had come to Jesus and he asked Jesus, what's the great commandment? Jesus answered him quickly. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So God's greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Every one of, the, of us have broken that, not just once, but many times we deserve God's greatest judgment. 
But thank God, because we're that kind of a sinner, how could we do any good work to take care of any of our sin? We're lost. We've broken God's greatest law. But by his grace, he put his son on the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, to be buried, to be raised three days later from the dead so that we can have eternal life. What a great Savior we have. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Muhammad can't save anybody. Buddha can't save anybody. The millions of Hindu gods can't save anybody. All the other gods that are worshipped by mankind today, including the Marvel Universe gods, all of them together cannot save one person. Only Christ gives eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's God's promise. So we see it would be a vain death. It would be an empty death if anybody could get to heaven any other way than through Jesus Christ. Not only do we see a vain death, but in the passage that we read to begin with, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. He's talking about the resurrection. You'll notice he says in verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? There has to be a resurrection from the dead for the gospel message to have be any message at all. He tells us just a few verses earlier, by the way, in verses 3 and 4, when he defines the gospel for us, Notice verse 1 of chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. By what? The gospel. Notice he says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Now this is vital because Romans 4.25 declares he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. If he had not come out of the grave bodily, then we could not be justified before God. Thank God he didn't just die for our sins, but he rose from the dead proving that we can be justified before God in his resurrection. Now, the point that he's making here is very, very plain in the passage. The religious leaders, you remember, when they asked Jesus for a sign, um, he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and only one sign will be given to this generation. That one sign was how Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. That's God's sign. You see, on that third day, he was vomited up on the ground uh, there on the shore by that whale. Jonah was vomited up. It's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I said it's a picture. In John chapter 2, Jesus told the Jews in verse 19, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And it says, but he spake of the temple of his body. You see, he predicted his resurrection from the dead. Now, in the passage that we read, you'll notice he says in verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, empty. What we're doing this morning is absolutely ridiculous if Jesus didn't come out of the grave. It's empty. It's worthless counts for nothing. And then he says, if that's true, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. I don't care how great your faith is. If Christ didn't come out of the grave, then guess what? Your faith is empty. Your your faith is in a false hope. Thank God the faith is real because the tomb is empty. He lives. And he goes on to say in verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. In other words, all those people who trusted Jesus, if there's no resurrection, they and they they died already, they are in hell burning for eternity. 
But you see, our faith is not vain because the tomb is empty. Christ did rise from the dead. And all those Roman soldiers that were put there on guard and the stone that they put over the grave could not keep him in there. That stone was not rolled away so that he could get out of the grave. He was already out of the grave. That stone was rolled away so those on the outside could see in that he wasn't there, that the tomb's empty and we have life and justification because of what's been done. Thank God it's not a vain death. Thank God our faith is not a vain faith in Jesus Christ. But then there's the tragedy of a vain man. I want you to turn over to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2. A lot of people talk about how strong their faith is. I want you to notice what he says beginning in verse 18. He says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now we know that a man is saved by faith. But our Bible does say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now it's true. Anybody could get up and say, I have faith in Christ. But we all know there are people that talk about their great faith in Christ who are still lost. They never got born again. You say, how are we going to have any idea whether or not they're saved? By their works. Now, their works don't save them. But we recognize when we see the works of a believer. And God gives us many descriptions of that in the Bible. If you are saved, your life is going to be different. If it's not different, then you didn't get it. When he saved me, here I was brought up in a home of drinking and cursing, only hearing the name Jesus as a curse word and using his name like that myself. A rock and roll disc jockey, then a country western disc jockey. I tell you, when God saved my soul, he cleaned up my foul mouth. He changed the things I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the house of God. I wanted to hear the preaching of the word of God. I wanted what God had for his children. He changed my life. He changed my walk. Now, all those things that were different in me are not things I did in order to get saved. They were things that I did because he saved me and he made me a new creature. Matter of fact, I never had to hear a message against cussing to stop cussing. I mean, I I never did feel that it was a right thing to do anyway at lost, but when I got saved, man, uh, to cuss would have made me feel so absolutely dirty and ashamed. Man, to have the Holy Spirit of God live within you, that changes everything. Amazing thing here, by the way. Turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want you to notice beginning in verse 9 how he describes these people at Corinth that had gotten saved. And he's, he's talking to these folks because evidently they, had, well, he lets us know in chapter 5 there was a man taking an adultery with his father's wife and they were going to have to kick him out of the church. The Holy Spirit of God had said that in chapter 5. Chapter 6, he says this in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God. 
Did you see that? He says, and such were some of you. Were some of you. Why did he say were? Because that's what they were. It's not what they were now. Now they're born again. Now they were changed. Their lifestyle had changed because God made them a new creature. Yeah, there are a lot of people. They, they show they, uh, they're a vain man. They talk about how spiritual they are. And by the way, I'm sorry, but every time I hear somebody, especially if I first meet them and they start talking to me about how spiritual they are, Brother Popwell, I have a red flag that goes up. I, evidently, they have to talk about it because they don't show it. And if you don't show it, there's at best a contaminated faith. That's trouble, vain man. Well, then Jesus talked about a vain worship. By the way, when you talk about vanity and empty, I'm just going to throw this in. I, I know we have someone, I know who it is, but I don't want to embarrass them, uh, that most every Sunday they bring some donuts in before church. I thank the Lord for anybody who brings donuts in. As long as they get it there before everything starts. Now, basically, those donuts are for the bus workers that are in by the time that they're brought in. But anybody who gets there first gets to eat them. The funny thing about that box of donuts, it says donuts right on it. Guess what I expect to find in a box that says donuts right on it. But every once in a while, I've gone over to that box that says donuts, beckoning me to come over to that table. My mouth starts to water. I'm especially looking forward to a blueberry donut. There always seems to be one in there. And because I'm, I'm trying to lose weight, I break it in half and only eat half of it. You know those little games that we play with ourselves to eat things we know we shouldn't eat. Isn't that right? And I went over there, not this morning, but this was a couple weeks ago. I went over to that donut box that said donuts, and somebody had already gotten to it. It was empty. I had made a vain trip all the way down that hall. <laughs> to try to get a donut out of an empty donut box. People had beat me there. I hate it. Vain things. You understand how... <laughs> I must go on. Mark chapter 7, are you there? Mark chapter 7. Notice a statement by the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, let me just describe what had just gone on. Jesus had talked about the problems with the traditions of the Jews. They had a number of traditions uh, that, for instance, they had a responsibility to take care of their parents. And taking care of their parents, that, by the way, is obviously Jesus teaching that we have a responsibility to make sure our parents in the old age are taken care of. But these Jewish religious leaders, these rabbis, they had come up with something pretty, pretty smart. They decided, now God didn't say this, but they decided that if you, if you committed all that you had to God, then because you had given it to God, you didn't have to take care of your parents. Now, you still had to use some of that for yourself because you got to live. And so by this tradition they had come up with, they had undone the commandment of God to take care of their parents. So he says, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. When people put tradition above the word of God, they have a vain worship. It's important that we understand this because we've got all kinds of excuses for disobeying God's word. And boy, some of them sound pretty good at times. But God wants obedience to his word. Let me just show you. 
Go over to the book of 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, notice verse 2. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now notice, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. God wants to be obeyed. Over and over we see it throughout the book of Deuteronomy, for instance. You get to Joshua chapter 1. And now that they've got a new leader, Joshua instead of Moses, God tells them in verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Vain worship. Vain worship. Although Jesus doesn't use the word vain when he's dealing with the woman at the well, he says, in, uh, says to her, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. You see, they had changed in their scripture the Mount of Blessing to the Mount of Cursing and the Mount of Cursing to the Mount of Blessing. And he said, You worship, you know not what. Uh, their worship wasn't good for anything because they worshiped incorrectly. You've got a lot of people around Madison and Huntsville, Alabama, for that matter. They're all around the world. People who think, well, God just going to have to accept my worship. If he doesn't like the way I worship, tough. Tough on you. It's not tough on God. God doesn't need you. God gives us how to worship in the scripture, and it begins through the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're not getting to heaven without him. And if you're going to try to worship in a way that's contrary to what he says in, in his word, then your worship will be vain. And all the cute little things you come up with to disobey God's word just means all of your worship is vanity. It's empty. It's meaningless. It counts for nothing. And then the tragedy of a vain religion. Go to James chapter 1. I'm almost done. Don't get too excited about that, but I am almost done. James chapter 1. Actually, I just have a couple more to give you. Won't take long. I want you to notice verse 26. He says, if any man among you seem to be religious, now look at this, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is vain. Did you get that? I didn't write it. I didn't sneak into your home and put it in your Bible. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. Yeah, we're supposed to bridle our tongue. We're not supposed to say everything we think. There's an awful lot of things that are said that don't need to be said. You can't bridle your tongue. Your religion's vain. Don't tell me how spiritual you are. Your religion's vain. Well, I thought it. I, I just thought it and I had to say it. No, you didn't. Shut your mouth. Or your religion's vain. You don't have to say everything. People have a gossipy, complaining, critical tongue. Their religion's vain. I mentioned, I think a couple weeks ago, R.G. Letourneau. He was a Christian businessman. He owned a large earth-moving company, big into that kind of thing. Said, he said that they had a big earth mover that they labeled as the Model G. Somebody asked him what the G stood for. He said the G stands for gossip because like gossip, this machine moves a lot of dirt and moves it fast. If you can't control your tongue, your religion's vain. Then you got vain labor. Go over back to Galatians. I'm almost done. I'm getting close. Galatians chapter 4, verse 11. In Galatians 4 and verse 11, he says, and he gave some of... I'm in Ephesians. I'm sorry. Let me get the right book. 
4.11, he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul had given part of his life to reach these people with the gospel of Christ. Somebody had come in, I'm sure that if this group was around today, they would have had a favorite internet preacher who preached some wild outlandish things and they were hung up on that internet preacher instead of the truth of the word of God. These people had come around and said, listen, in order to really be saved, yes, you have to trust Jesus, but you also have to keep Moses' law and be circumcised according to the law of Moses. And these people had started to believe it. And if they really did believe it, then Paul had wasted his time with them. Now, I know every pastor. Now, we, we don't judge whether or not or what our chances are of our, our work in trying to be a help to some people to grow in Christ, uh, whether or not it has a good chance of working. But when it doesn't, you do feel like you've done all that for nothing. Because God's word is true and God's word works. He warns us about everything we need to know anything about. Well, I know some Christians once and they hurt my feelings. How do you know they were Christians? Well, they said they were. Okay, does that mean they were? Amazing how many people are going to quit on God because they got their feelings hurt. I'll tell you what, we've done him far more wrong than he's ever done to us. And we're going to quit the church because one person did us wrong. So we're going to hold them all guilty of it. Yeah, we're so narcissistic. The problem isn't with them, it's with us when we start thinking like that. Remember in the first few years of home computers? Oh, I used to get so angry. Some of you probably did too when you type some paper for something. You've got, oh, several pages, 25, 30 pages that you've typed only for it suddenly to go out and all those words that were on that screen are gone. And you spent all that time working for nothing. Or even worse yet, the disc you have goes out. I had a fellow tell me, I said, man, all that was wasted. He said, did you back it up? I said, no, I didn't back it up. He said, evidently it wasn't important if you didn't back it up. So now I back everything up. Amen. Of course, that won't do me any good. I won't be able to find it. <laughs> I got another one. I'm not going to give it to you. You don't want your faith to be vain. You don't want your faith to be vain. You don't want your worship to be vain. You want to count for something. You don't, you don't want to be like Geraldo. Everyone see all that time and money put in there, getting all these cameras in there, open something wonderful up, and it's empty. Tell you what, Jesus is real. His death, burial, and resurrection is real. Those who trust him get a real salvation and go to heaven. And when you get saved, he gives you real eternal life and forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah. Justified before God because, thank God, the tomb is empty. He did rise from the dead. It's real. As Darcel McCoy used to think, sing, it's real, it's real. I know it's real. Hallelujah. It's real. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Dear God, deal with hearts today. For any without Christ, may they see that without him, they could belong to a thousand different churches and still die and go to hell. They must have Christ as Savior they could have been a Baptist for the last 50 years. They'd still die and go to hell if they hadn't had a time when by faith they turned to Jesus Christ and took him as their Savior. God, I pray today. I pray first of all for any that are lost that they'd see their need and come and be saved. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that are saved that they would show reality in that salvation they have and their worship would be real and not vain, and their walk would be real and not vain, that their words would be real and not vain. Dear God, do a work on hearts this morning, I pray in Jesus' name.